Welcome, welcome everybody. Good afternoon to our Emory Living with Dementia webinar series. And this is brought to you through the Emory Cognitive Neurology and Integrated Memory Care Clinics. Um, we do this monthly. Um, these are just topics that uh, we uh, have been told by family members or we have uh, had questions asked about uh, during our sessions. And so uh, today, we are fortunate um, to have attorney Dion Duckett with us. And before uh, we allow her to introduce herself, I'd like to give a few housekeeping details. Uh, one, I am Alice Cooper. I'm one of the social workers in the clinic, in the uh, cognitive neurology clinic. I am joined by my colleagues, Ashley Varner, who's in the cognitive neurology clinic, uh, Laura Mathers and Jenny Gay are in the Integrated Memory Care Clinic. Um, we would love for you to ask questions, but what we want to do is we're going to answer those questions at the end of the presentation. And so if you would please put your questions in the question and answer box down at the bottom of your screen. Usually that's where it is. Please don't wait until the end. When the question pops in your mind, go ahead and put it in that box so we can be able to filter those and everybody get their questions answered. Um, okay, what I'm going to do is I am going to turn it over to Attorney Duckett. And thank you so much for being with us today. Okay, good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alice, for the introduction and also to Ashley and Jenny and who's that with Jenny? Laura. <laughs> Lauren. Okay. I appreciate being invited to, um, to speak and present to you guys for um, Emory. And I actually, just a little side, I, I used to work for Emory University a few years in the early 2000s. Um, I was the director of development services for health sciences. So, um, but just, I'm going to share my screen and then I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm glad that everybody's able to attend because I think this is important information. Uh, so let's see, we're going to share the screen and screen three. So does everyone see protecting your lifestyle, your loved ones and your legacy? So this is um, talking about long-term care planning and information for caregivers and those who need care. <clears throat> I like to start off with my disclaimer. Uh, this presentation is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be construed as written advice about a federal tax or state tax or other legal matter. And viewers should consult with their own professional advisors to evaluate or pursue tax accounting, financial, or legal planning strategies. And so um, now to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I am an elder law attorney. My office, I'm a solo practitioner. My office is Duckett Law Office LLC, located in East Point, but we serve the entire metro area and, and, and the state of Georgia. <clears throat> um, Education, I earned my law degree at Howard University and MBA in accounting at Morgan State and my bachelor's in computer science from Goucher College. I have a variety of legal and non-legal corporate government. I've worked everywhere. Um, most recently before becoming an estate planning attorney, I was a corporate associate straight out of law school. Um, and then I, I, my business background, I didn't like the adversarial nature of law. So I got out for a while. And um, immediately before starting this practice, I was Dean of Students for Howard University School of Law for about nine years. And then I moved back home. I was born in Hartford, Connecticut, but raised in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, went to Ello Kimberly Elementary, uh, Woodward Academy for middle school and high school and Benjamin E. Mays. Um, my motivation for this practice area, I told you I got out of law for a minute because it was too adversarial for me. We were always fighting or preparing for a fight, even though I was transactional. And so my family, my father um, had Alzheimer's. He was, he was a retired physician and he developed Alzheimer's and I'm the oldest of seven. And so my youngest sister 
uh, it's funny, my parents had the first five of us in eight years, but then the last two were kind of oops and oops. So I'm 20 years older than the baby who has Down syndrome. So we went to an elder law attorney to assist my dad with his planning. And that's when I said, hey, this seems like the practice area for me. And then years later in 2017, I started to practice. <clears throat> so um, that is that is my motivation, and that's a little bit about me. So now we're going to get into the presentation. Got a lot of information to cover. Okay. So we're going to talk about the who, what, when, where, and why for planning for long-term care. So first, who? We're talking about those who need care and also the caregivers who are providing that care. And caregivers are a variety of people. They're the people who are living with family members who need care. They're people who give rides for family living, family members who need care. They're people who just provide backup and support in any way whatsoever, no matter how small or large the role. Um, what we're talking about long-term care planning. When, when long-term care planning, you know, we're talking about what happens when you become, if, if you should become incapacitated, how are you going to take care of yourself? How are you going to manage your property? And how are you going to take care of the people that you were taking care of and the people whose property you were managing? Uh, when to do long-term care uh, planning? Now. Time is always of the essence. And if you've recently had a diagnosis, my understanding is that, um, that um, the people here are family members or, um, or individuals who, re who have recent diagnoses. And like I said, my father had Alzheimer's and he was able to do his planning when he had Alzheimer's because as long as you have the capacity to understand what you're doing, why you're doing, know what you own, then you're able to do that planning. <clears throat> so um, where? That's the care environment. You can get care in home. You can get care in an institution. There's lots of different options. Uh, why do you want to do the planning for easy transition? Uh, you know, we all hope and plan to stay healthy for the rest of our lives. But you know, we are all the people are living longer, and care does become an issue. And even I've got clients who are 92 years old, still in their right minds, but you know, we slow down. Uh, and then how? Estate planning, um, long-term care planning tools are things that we'll be discussing. Okay, so when we talk about who's involved in caregiving, um, I mentioned it already, those who need care, those are the loved ones who need care. Uh, and we're dealing with management, management of their care, management of their property, providing assistance um, and control. Sometimes it's challenging for our loved ones to give up control and it's challenging for us to take control. For me, my father, um, my father was the chief of anesthesia. He was used to being in charge and he was the king of his castle. And so when I, the daughter, now have to kind of take the role of the parent, it was a, it was, it was a challenge. Um, and he selected me to do that. Uh, and then, then, you know, the transition, how, how to ease into that transition and also making the transition um, smoother by doing the planning. Uh, those who provide care, the caregivers, the same issue, management, assistance, assistance for those who need care and assistance for those who are providing care, control um, and transition. <clears throat> and, and control also involves selecting as, as, the, as the person who needs care, selecting the people you want to help you provide that care. Uh, others who are involved are your medical professionals, geriatric professionals and social workers, legal professionals, financial advisors, CPAs, and support groups. What does long-term care planning involve? So um, it involves planning for incapacity to address concerns. And so, as we said, management, that starts with a family or support network conversation. And so that's, I always use my family as an example. Once my father had a diagnosis, of um, L, of Alzheimer's, and we we were noticing that things, you know, one of the things he was talking about was driving on the highway, and everyone driving in the wrong direction. Well, what do we do about that? Um, so the whole family, and for me, it helped that my brother was also a physician, and he was also a man. Sometimes that mono a mono helps. So um, so 
you know, the family had a conversation. And even my mother who was involved, my parents divorced after 30 years, but my mother got involved in that caregiving. Um, assistance, determine the best person to manage your care, um, determining who you want to do that, um, manage your care, and determine the best person to manage your property and finances. Those don't have to be the same people. So sometimes if you're using family members, you know, you may have children who are very good with money, but aren't the best people person or wouldn't be the best care person or don't have the time to put in. Um, then you may have someone who's a great caregiver, but not so good with money. Um, and so, so you can select different, you can select joint agents to serve, but you wanna think about, you don't choose agents based on who's the oldest or, you know, my dad started out giving everybody a role. You know, there were seven of us. You don't do it that way. You want to decide based on your knowledge um, who the best person would be. <clears throat> then um, determine the, the preferred person to provide assistance. That's based when you do it while you have the capacity to choose, then you can designate who do you prefer and then determine how this should be done. Um, then with the control, you can make your wishes known now through your planning. You can make your decisions while you are able. Once you, once you lose capacity, then if no planning has been done, you have to go through the court process. And then with the transition, we're talking about putting the right tools in place ahead of time. We'll talk about those in a few minutes, implementing the plan, and then managing crisis if you did not actually plan in advance. So when to plan. Proactive planning, you have to first look at your capacity concerns. And so in order to make a will, create a trust, um, create powers of attorney, you have to have the capacity to do that. You have to understand what you're doing. Um, you have to, for a will, you have to know who your family members are. And you also have to know um, what property you own. If you're not able to state that, uh, then you don't have the capacity to create a will and, and your family members can't create a will for you. Uh, then asset protection concerns. And so that deals with protecting the assets for the loved one who needs the care. It also um, deals with being able to qualify for, for government benefits without having to lose the assets. Uh, and then also when, when the loved one passes, what do they want to happen to their assets and who they want them to be distributed to and how do they protect their beneficiaries um, when they receive the assets. If you haven't done proactive planning, uh, and, and proactive planning is generally done five years in advance if we're talking about applying for means-tested government benefits. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but typically there's a five-year look back period. So you wanna do your planning um, and that's for giving, you can't just give things away in order to qualify for benefits. Um, so you wanna do your planning early on, like when you receive a diagnosis so that um, if later after five years, you need nursing home care, you can, um, you can apply and qualify. Um, if you're in a crisis, this means you're already in a nursing home or you'll be going soon, you can still plan. Um, when you plan proactively, you can usually save up to 100% of your assets. Um, with crisis plan, and that's for a single person or for a married couple. With crisis planning, you can usually save up to 50% if you're an individual. And if you're a married couple, you can usually save up to 100% because um, Medicaid allows allowances um, for the in-home, for the wealth spouse, because they don't want to impoverish the wealth spouse. But you have to act expeditiously. So as soon as someone goes into a, into a hospital or a nursing home for rehab. Um, if rehab, Medicare does not cover nursing home care. Um, it only covers up to 100 days. And so if they decide that it's not working, you'll get a notice that um, you're gonna have to pay. And so Medicare doesn't cover that. And the average cost of care in Georgia is $8,000 a month. So, so as soon as, even though we plan to get better and go home, you may wanna start looking into possible planning as soon as something happens. Okay, so where will long-term care take place? It can take place at home. It can take place in an assisted living facility. 
It can take place in group caregiving homes or in a nursing facility. And so all of those, you know, there's different care available. If you're a veteran, you may be able to get, uh, may be able to qualify for the, the um, what's it called, the, the aid and attendance allowance, which is a monthly stipend. Uh, if you're in an assist, that can help if you're at home or if you're in an assisted living or group caregiving home that doesn't qualify for nursing home level care. Um, you could also, um, for nursing home level care, there are waivers that will provide some Medicaid benefits if you are still in the home or if you're in an assisted living facility. The qualification requirements are the same, but there, there aren't, they, they pass the, they distribute those based on the level of need. Uh, and there's usually some sort of waiting list for those benefits. Uh, why, should, why should you plan for long-term care? Again, you wanna be prepared for a possible crisis. You wanna ease the transition. You wanna preserve assets. Um, if, you have, if you have been diligent and responsible all of your life, and, um, and, and saved. Now, if you have a crisis and you have to go into long-term nursing home care, uh, it, it's up to you. You have three ways to pay. You can pay out of your savings, you can pay using long-term care insurance, or you can apply for Medicaid. And so if your goal is to preserve those assets so that you can pay for some of the extras for yourself and your care, take care of those that you're already taking care of, and leave a legacy for your life, loved ones, then you may want to um, you know, plan so that you can qualify for Medicaid. Or if it's early enough, you can qualify for long-term care insurance. Um, my understanding the sweet spot for that is between the ages of 55 and 65 years old. After 65, it becomes more difficult to qualify and more um, expensive to get that long-term care insurance. Uh, and then to avoid living probate, you know, we, we talk about two types of probate. Probate, most people think about is probate after you die and your assets go through the probate process. Living probate is the guardianship conservatorship process. And that's when you haven't designated someone that you want to serve as your guardian or conservatorship, then you have to go to a court and have someone appointed. And it can be a family member or it could be a total stranger. It could be the county administrator and the county guardian. <clears throat> and the other reason again is to make sure your desires are known and to control who and how your care is provided. How do you accomplish long-term care planning? There are five basic planning tools. Uh, those are trust, wills, financial powers of attorney, advanced directives for healthcare, authorizations for release of protected medical records. And these tools can be used in your Medicaid planning and, and the rules for Medicaid planning are very complex. And so you wanna use an elder law and a state planning attorney who understands and is familiar with the rules who can assist you in that planning. So let's talk about a will-based plan. There's two basic um, foundations for a comprehensive estate plan. It's either the will or the trust. With a will, probate is required. The probate process is a public process. A lot of people think that with a will, the executor can just take the will and start doing what needs to be done. But actually, that's not the case. Um, the executor has to take the will and file a petition and file it into court and have the will proven as valid and then have the executor appointed. And then it's usually a minimum six to eight month process for the probate. And that's if everything's going smoothly, nobody's objecting. Uh, and since COVID things have been taking a little bit longer. A will is effective only after death. And, and I'll back up. When I said it's a public process, it's public because once that will is filed in the court, and um, your petition is filed, those documents are accessible to anybody, you know, your neighbor, you know, in Atlanta, there's a lot of people trying to buy property. And I think it's an intrusion when I get those text messages, people offering to buy my backyard. Um, my house is on two lots. Um, so um, it becomes a public process. <coughs> uh, it doesn't provide for lifetime management of assets. <coughs> 
excuse me, my, my seasonal allergies have been acting up. A will does not provide for lifetime management of assets because it only becomes effective after death. I often have people call me um, about their parents and they're saying, I'm the executor of the will, but the parent is still alive. So if you're the executor, you have no control until after you've been appointed. Um, and you also, um, in the will, you designate guardians for minor children and trustees for testamentary trusts. Testamentary trusts are trusts that are created by operation of the will. For instance, if you say, I want to leave property to my son in a trust or property to my daughter in a trust, that's a testamentary trust that's created by the will. <clears throat> a trust-based plan avoids probate and it maintains privacy. And I'll give you a really brief overview of a trust-based plan. A trust is a separate entity. You wanna look at it like a treasure chest. And what you do is you transfer all of your property to the trust. So the, your property is now in a treasure chest, so you don't own it, the trust owns it. But you still, while you have the capacity, you still manage it and you're still the beneficiary. But in the trust, um, you, are, you make provisions Basically, the contract is a book of instructions on how you want it managed. And so you provide for successor trustees if you should become incapacitated. So you are designating someone to manage your property. They don't have to go to the court through the conservatorship process to get permission or to get appointed. Um, and then you also can, can designate death trustee. And that's similar to the executor. The trust can have all of the same provisions that a will can have. And it says how you want the property distributed on your death. And because it doesn't get filed in the court, you're able to maintain privacy. It's effective during life and after death. We're talking about a revocable living trust as your foundation document. Um, and you can revoke it and you can change it as long as you have capacity. And then when you die, it becomes irrevocable. Um, it provides for lifetime management of your property and it maximizes long-term care planning options. Now, when we get into planning for quality, for asset protection for yourself, um, we're talking about an irrevocable trust um, because in order to qualify for means-tested benefits, you can't be the person who is benefiting from or um, managing, ha has control over the benefits. So we, we come up with a plan to move it into an irrevocable trust and it can be, it's, it, the beneficiaries will be who you ultimately want to receive the property, but they are able to provide for you. They are now managing the property. They're the designated beneficiaries, but as beneficiaries, they can receive distributions and provide for, provide for you, the person who creates the irrevocable trust. Okay. Um, financial powers of attorney. In all of these things, you have an agent. So the agent is the person who's named to act under the power of attorney, under, um, the, under the trust, it's called a trustee. The principal is the person who um, creates the power of attorney. And so the agent acts in the best interest of the principal. And there's different types of powers of attorney. There's general and there's limited. A, gem a general power of attorney is what we're usually dealing with. And that covers everything. Um, a limited personality, uh, a power of attorney can be limited to the transaction. I'll give you an example. When my sister and her husband were buying their first house, they were out of town and weren't going to be able to make it to the closing. And so they gave a limited power of attorney to my mother. It was limited to that sole transaction. And my mother was able to sign as their agent at the closing. <clears throat> uh, springing versus immediate. You don't see springing very often um, because of the complications. Springing is the power of attorney that becomes effective when a certain event happens. So that could be something like when two doctors state, certify in writing that I'm incapacitated and unable to manage my own affairs. Um, immediate, it becomes effective immediately when once you sign that piece of paper. The springing power of attorney Often they're not recommended by attorneys because usually when you need that power of attorney, you need it now. And if you look at COVID, for instance, trying to get a certification from an attorney, let alone two, trying to get that appointment could be a challenge. And sometimes, um, not from an attorney, from a physician, 
a physician may also um, be concerned about their own liability issues if they if they're certifying something for someone else to be able to take over your money and your property. So, and that's where we get back to the selection of the agent. You need to select somebody who is trustworthy and good with money. If they're bad with their own credit, if they're bad with their own money, they're going to be bad with yours. Um, an example, I had a client years ago in Maryland who her brother brought her in to do her planning. She said, make my brother my agent. Then her daughter saw the draft documents and her feelings were hurt. So the client said, okay, make my daughter the agent. When the ink was dry on that power of attorney, the daughter started taking mom's money, fixing up mom's house, but she wasn't fixing it up for mom. She was fixing it up for after mom died for herself. And then she took that power of attorney and she co-signed mom's name to granddaughter's student loan. And then mom was back in my office, changing back to her brother. Now, uh, uh, these agents are fiduciaries and have legal Respond, legal obligations to act in the best interest of the principal, but the remedy is a lawsuit and that can be costly. And she wasn't gonna sue her daughter. <laughs> uh, powers of attorney, you'll often see that they're durable and that means they are still in effect after you become incapacitated. Medical powers of attorney, they're similar. You've got an agent, the person who creates, no, an agent and a principal, the principal is the person who creates the power of attorney. The agent is the person who, um, who the principal designates to be the agent. It gives authority to make all healthcare decisions. The common objectives include making healthcare decisions for the principal, choosing a facility or remaining in the home, managing medical providers, authorizing pain relief, and making end of life decisions based on what you've provided in your documents. <coughs> Then there's the living will advance directive that memorializes your end of life decisions, including life support, whether to continue or discontinue, artificial nutrition or hydration, organ donation and other specific wishes. It usually contains definitions to assist with end of life decisions such as persistent vegetative state, a terminal condition, life support and comfort care. Um, it does not contemplate physician-assisted suicide. Some states combine the medical power of attorney and living will. In Georgia, that's what we do. We have a statutory advanced directive for healthcare. And so the first part has your power of attorney um, agent designation. And the second part has your decisions about whether you want to continue life support and artificial nutrition or hydration if you're in an end-stage condition and the doctors don't think that they can do anything for you. Um, you can say that you want to be allowed to die naturally, but keep me out of pain. That's comfort care. Or you can say, um, do everything, uh, do everything to treat me, continue treating me because because miracles do happen. Um, or you can say something in, in between. Give me artificial nutrition or hydration, but don't give me a ventilator. Uh, so this is where you get to say what you want to do. It takes the burden off of your agents and your loved ones for trying to figure out what to do. Um, and then some states, like I mentioned, we have a statutory form, have a form that's promulgated by the Department of Health, another agency or specified by statute. And we have a statutory form uh, that, that you can use. The HIPAA authorization. Uh, this is, you know, when you, whenever you go to the doctor or healthcare provider, they give you their privacy statement. And basically it says that your medical provider cannot give out your private medical information without your written permission. So the HIPAA authorization is that written permission. And so it provides that, um, that, that, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so basically it provides a list of people or agents who can receive information from your medical providers. And those can be people who are already your agents under the healthcare, they will have authority, but you may have additional people who, although you don't want them to make decisions, you want them to be able to get information, to call the doctor and get information. Now you wouldn't want, like I have six siblings, you don't want to list all seven and um, have everybody calling the doctor at once. But this is where you can designate people who are able to contact the physician or any other healthcare provider and get that information. 
Um, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't deal with decision making, only the right to receive information. It can be limited or broad in scope. It can be limited in time or not. Um, and it covers most medical providers, but um, it doesn't supersede the provider's form. So if a provider has their own form, they're not required to use your HIPAA release form. And so now we talk about planning for long-term care. I touched on it a little bit. As we said, people are living longer because, and that's due to improvements in healthcare. And for this reason, quality of care becomes important. We talked about the cost of nursing home care. The average cost of nursing home care in Georgia is about $8,000 a month. And, and it gets higher. I've had clients $10,000, $13,000 a month. The ways to pay are private pay, self-pay out of your, um, your life savings or family members chip in, that often happens. Uh, Long-term care insurance, it's best, you know, if you're the right age and you're pretty healthy to look into that now, it's a great benefit. Uh, and, or to apply for Medicaid. And a lot of people feel like they don't qualify for Medicaid or they don't want to use government assistance or welfare, but we've paid for through our taxes and everything you've paid, you've, you've been responsible, you've saved, you've paid your taxes, so you've paid for these services. Now, generally, and it's, in, it's, it's, in, it's um, adjusted for inflation, but an individual can't have more than $2,000 a month in income and can't have more than $2,000 worth of assets um, to qualify for Medicaid. There are certain things that are exempt, like the house that you live in, um, and one car, and, and that's for an individual. There are allowances for, uh, for married couples, again, so that, so that you don't impoverish the well spouse. So if one spouse is well and the other spouse is, um, needs nursing home care, there are ways to qualify by transferring, uh, transferring to the well spouse. But the main thing that you need to know is that you can't, even if you exceed the $2,000 a month in income, and you exceed the $2,000 worth of assets, you can do planning to preserve your assets, to preserve them for yourself and to preserve them for the care of others. If you are able to, the further in advance you're able to prepare, pre prepare the better able you are to save. Um, for instance, the house, it is exempt. It's an exempt asset while you're alive, but if it's in your name, when you die, if your estate is worth more than $25,000 and the government has paid for your long-term care, then they're gonna to wanna to be reimbursed, which may result in selling the house. There are exemptions. Um, for instance, if you, I, my youngest sister has Down syndrome, so you can transfer the house to an adult disabled child. My mother could transfer the house to my sister and not have it, have not be penalized. Um, you can also, there's a, there's a adult child caregiver exemption. So there's different exemptions and there's different strategies and tools that are allowed to allow you to um, transfer your assets. But if you don't do it the right, right way, there's a five-year look back period. So at the time you apply for Medicaid, you don't apply until you've gotten yourself to those levels, the 2000, 2000. They're higher than that adjusted for inflation. And so now you apply and they look back five years to see if you've given property away. And what that means, gifts are transfers for less than fair market value. So you can't sell someone your $200,000 house for $100,000. That's a $100,000 gift. Okay, so they look back five years. They have access to the IRS tax records. They ask you for all your bank statements and they add up all, they determine what are what are disqualifying gifts and they add them up. And so there's a penalty divisor. It's about the same as the average cost of care. So let's use them round number, say $8,000. If they add up and say that you've given away $80,000 worth of assets, they divide that by $8,000. And now you've got 10 months of disqualification and you now have put yourself in a position where you have $2,000 a month income and two thousand dollars worth of assets. So how do you pay for those ten months? Okay. So the planning plans for all of that. The purpose of planning is to minimize the disqualification period, minimize or eliminate, and to maximize the savings of your assets. 
And so I have many people who see my card or call me and they say, I should have known you last year. And so, so I just let you know that so that you know, if you're in this situation, whether it's you know five or more years in advance, or you're in a crisis situation, contact an elder law attorney. <clears throat> Planning for loved ones with special needs. And so elder law is a misnomer because um, the needs of those who are aging are very similar, often similar to the needs of those who have disabilities. And they may also need to qualify for means tested government benefits. Uh, and an inheritance may cause a loss in benefits. Taking my sister, for example, she has Down syndrome. And so if she wanted to qualify for means tested benefits, um, and then she inherits, a, you know, using, let, let's use the, um, I'm sorry, the nursing home example. So there were two older sisters in their 80s. One was in a nursing home and Medicaid, she had gotten everything in a position. So she qualified for Medicaid. Medicaid was paying for her care. So that means she can't have more than $2,000 worth of assets. Now the sister, the well sister dies and leaves her $20,000. Well, that can bump her off of her benefits. And so um, if her, her sister had provided a special needs trust for the sister who was in the nursing home, then that property would have gone into trust and it would never be owned by the disabled sister and it wouldn't be counted against her. And so with our loved ones who have disabilities, there's all types of special needs trust that can be created and supplemental, a supplemental needs trust is one created by, by a person for, a, for someone else who is, a dis, who is disabled. A special needs trust is the same thing, but it's created by a person for themselves using their own assets. And after the age of 65, you cannot create your own special needs trust. Um, but both can help preserve eligibility for benefits. Uh, so let's see the next slide. Finding the right attorney. So that's that's basically my presentation. So finding the right attorney, you want to look at is the attorney's primary focus on estate planning and or elder law. Uh, does the attorney practice collaborative based planning? Because working with your CPA, your financial advisor, or your insurance broker. Because a lot of times, you know, people would meet with their financial advisor. Um, regularly, much more regularly than they meet with their estate planning attorney. And so that person may know more about what you have than you do because they're keeping record of it. Uh, does the attorney charge a flat fee or an hourly rate for providing estate planning or other services in your elder law services? Neither, it doesn't mean that one is better than the other. Um, it's just with a flat fee, typically what happens is the attorney, you meet with the attorney, find out everything, have a conversation about your goals and objectives, then they can recommend the plan and tell you how much it will cost. With the hourly rate, you're paying, um, you're paying whatever the hourly rate is, $400, $500, $300. And you know, you're paying for time on phone calls, time on meetings, time. And so there you don't know exactly how you can get an estimate, but you don't know exactly how much it's going to cost. Does the attorney have a process in place to keep your plan up to date? Some people call it a continuum of care plan. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you want to ask yourself, can I see myself working closely with this attorney? Finally, we have time for questions. Okay, thank you so much for that um, thorough presentation. It covered a lot of topics that are really important to be considering. Um, when you, for anyone, um, but particularly when you have um, this diagnosis where you know you can expect some changes in your thinking um, to be occurring. If you have questions, um, again, please put them in the Q&A um, and we will get to them um, as they come in. Um, that should be on the bottom of your um, Zoom panel down here. Ms. Stuckett, I got a question just yesterday from somebody um, that and and I you you touched on this, but it's some it was from a from a um, uh, a care partner, a, uh, an adult, an adult, uh, an adult child who was wondering, okay, so what do we what do we do if we don't have five years to to uh, 
to advance care plan. Um, it's a new diagnosis, but um, but they're looking at needing care sooner than than later. Do you have um, thoughts? Well, there's crisis planning, and with the crisis planning, you generally don't um, do that unless the person. Now, it depends on what sooner versus for sooner is. So if someone is already in, in the hospital, uh, and I will say this, when you're when the person is in the hospital and they're going to likely have to move into rehab, you don't want to take them home first because there's a there's a duration of stay requirement. Okay. And that's typically 30 days. And and also when it comes to finding placement in the place you want to be. Um, the social workers at the hospital are better able to get you the placement that you want. And so, so if, if your loved one is in a nursing home or going very soon, then and I've lost track of the question. You said, what if, <laughs> so then, then you're not necessarily using like the irrevocable trust, you're doing a spend town, but you can only spend on certain things. And sometimes you may end up giving some things away that will trigger a disqualification, but in the planning, you are also making provisions to pay for that disqualification period. And so, so the key is because when a crisis happens, time seems to fly. And so when a crisis happens, the, the key is to call somebody as soon as possible so that because you will have to gather all of the financial information um, and that's how the plan is going to be developed. And I will say another thing about nursing homes, nursing homes now provide, often have someone who will do those applications, but, and I've met with some of the people who provide those applications, they don't, and, and one woman in particular I recently met with um, worked for Medicaid for 30 years but she didn't know about the strategies for people who may have accumulated some wealth that they could actually qualify. She knows how to work with the people who are already there. And so, so you wanna work with an elder law attorney because she has now started referring me some of the people who are in the nursing home who are paying privately because she didn't know that there were actual strategies that could be used to preserve assets. But like I said, if it's an individual, you can usually save up to 50%. But if you're talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars or more, you know, um, you know, it like I said, it all depends. A couple hundred thousand dollars or more, if you're able to save, preserve a hundred thousand dollars, um, then that works for you. Uh, the other thing is, let's see, for married couples, like I said, there's allowances. So if there's a wealth spouse, there's there's what's called an allowance for the community spouse. And you're also not penalized for most of those transfers. Um, for the spending down, um, there, are, there are certain things you can spend on, like a funeral plan, the limit is $10,000, but there's rules about you know, the nature of the funeral plan. Um, you can possibly have a funeral savings account, but you can't have both. And so there's limits on all of those things. And so there's things, you can buy things for yourself. You can you can upgrade your vehicle. There's, there's lots of different things that you can do to spend down that money to and, and minimize the penalty that you'll have and maximize your savings. Thank you. That's excellent. Um, I think it is evident, or if it is not evident yet, it will become evident pretty clearly that um, when patients and families have questions and they start asking us about these things, it really is complicated and so dependent on each individual situation um, that the social workers probably know enough to be dangerous, but you really need to be getting um, your advice from an attorney who knows your specific situation and who knows the whole picture. Your um, friend's example um, was a great one, Ms. Beckett. We have another question that came in um, that may, be, that may be really specific, but it said, if I create a special needs trust for myself that is outside of the will, would you then transfer assets into the trust? And what about moving IRAs? And so I don't know if that depends on specific situations or if you could talk more about how um, IRAs and other retirement accounts work with 
um, a trust. Okay, so um, I can't speak specifically to that, but I can talk about IRAs and special needs trusts in general. So with the special needs trust, there are two types. Um, there's first party. So a first party special needs trust is where I take my own money and I put it in a special need and, or assets and I put it in a special needs trust for myself. After the age of 65, you cannot do that. Um, the special need, the first party special needs trust is required. All of the trusts have to be reviewed by, um, by the state or the county agency. Um, but a first party special needs trust is required to have a payback provision. So if you take your own assets and put it into a special needs trust so that you can qualify for government benefits, when you die, the government wants to be repaid. Okay, because the benefits are for people who don't, who have, who have lower assets. So you've caused yourself to have a low level of assets so that you can qualify for the government benefits. So they want to be repaid. And so they will have a bill, they will have a bill for everything that they've paid over the years, and that will have to come against the estate. And that comes before distributions go to any family member. Now, with, um, now if your estate is worth less than $25,000, then they won't pursue asset recovery. Now there's the third party. That's where, take my sister who has Down syndrome. So that's where I take my money and I create a special needs trust for my sister. That's a third party. You're not creating it for yourself. So, and you're not using her money. You're using your money or someone else's money. So third party is when you have a beneficiary and a different person is creating the trust and providing the assets that go into the trust. There's no payback provision in that trust. And so in your estate planning, typically with my clients, I do a contingent special needs trust for everybody. So even if all of your beneficiaries are well, you know, there could be a car accident, um, an accident with a big truck. Usually when someone gets a big settlement, there's, that's because there's going to be big medical bills. And so qualifying for Medicaid is a way to preserve the settlement money. Um, but also if you were leaving something to someone, um, the wills and trusts that I draft say, if at the time of my death, one of any of my beneficiaries has become a special needs person who's disabled and on government benefits or needs to apply for them, then don't put it, don't give it to them outright, put it in a special needs trust for them. And that way it never gets to them and it's never counted. If it goes straight to them and then they create a special needs trust, it becomes a first party trust with a payback provision. Did that answer the question? <laughs> I'm not sure I know enough to know if that answered the question, but okay. <laughs> for additional questions, um, I would encourage you to seek the advice of an attorney that's representing you. Um, another question that we had come in, it said, what do you do when your loved one is already in the advanced stages of the disease, but is being financially exploited by someone? This family friend was willingly added to bank accounts, um, but is missing funds for themselves, leaving the patient nearly penniless. Um, Adult Protective Services has said the friend is not at fault because they are um, the person with dementia is willing to participate and has sort of set this up, even though the patient has already um, gotten this diagnosis. Um, a power of attorney is not in place. Uh, what would the next steps be? Would it be guardianship? If the person does not have capacity, then yes, if there's, if there's no power of attorney in place and there's no healthcare directive in place. Now, um, incapacity does not mean that um, eccentric or making, making decisions that you wouldn't make. So, so if a person is in their right mind, but doing things that you don't think are advisable, that doesn't deem them incapacitated. When you're doing, in Georgia, we have guardianship and we have conservatorship. So guardianship is a guardian of the person. That's the health care and managing care in general. Um, conservatorship is guardian of the property. That's managing the property and paying bills and all that kind of stuff. And so... So to be deemed 
incapacitated or, or, or to have a guardian or conservator put in place, you are taking away, they refer to the disabled person as a, or incapacitated person as a potential ward. You are taking away that person's rights. And so the court, it's, it's, the, it's the alternative of last resort. The court wants to see plans in place. Um, but if not, if you can demonstrate that the person is incapacitated and can't make responsible decisions to um, manage their property and they can't make responsible decisions about their health care, then yes, the procedure would be to go through guardianship and, and or conservatorship to have somebody appointed. Thank you. Are there other questions, comments that people have that you'd like to put in the chart? I just want to say how excellent this was. It was just really a, a very thorough, complete presentation, and I learned a ton. So thank you. Thank you. I want. Can I make one more point about guardianship and conservatorship? Um, <laughs> There are different types. There's emergency, there's temporary, and there's permanent. Okay, and so a lot of people want to do an emergency. There's a very high bar. I'm, I've got a hearing on Friday for an emergency guardianship and conservatorship. It has to be a life or death matter. So what? But what happens with the? So typically for a permanent guardianship proceeding, that can take you know three months, to, um, one to three months. I think Fulton County, we had a meeting with the judges and they said their goal was to have them completed by three months. With the permanent, if you file the petition and the court finds that there's enough facts there that demonstrate that it is an emergency, it's a life or death matter, um, the property is in danger of, of being lost immediately, not, you know, because, not, not because if something's not done at some point in time. Uh, then they have to have a hearing within three to five days after the petition is filed. So like we filed this, this petition on Monday and we got notice yesterday that the hearing is on Friday. So, and then they will, if, and so they found enough cause to have the hearing and then they will, they will because you're taking away somebody's right, they will appoint an attorney to represent the person who's disabled or incapacitated, they will send out an evaluator, all that's going on right now, um, to go out and evaluate the circumstance, and then they will have a hearing uh, to determine whether, in fact, it is an emergency. If you're rejected on the emergency end, that doesn't mean that the permanent won't be, won't be granted. That just means that the court didn't think it was an emergency. And so, but Again, that's why planning is important. I have, I'll give you an example. I had a client who's here. Um, initially, her brother was the client. Her brother lived in Arizona. He and his wife called because she had had a stroke and she was incapacitated. And they saw her bills coming in the mail. The mortgage was due and she, they called the bank. She hadn't done any planning. They couldn't get any information. And so... So now they, and, and now they have to seek guardianship conservatorship. And, and, now, and it was COVID. So you can't, it was trying to coordinate with the nursing home and all these different things. It was a challenge. Fortunately, she got better. And then we were able to do an estate plan instead and do those powers of attorney and advanced directors for healthcare. But that's why it's important to do the planning now. And even with guardianship, when you see something happening, Go ahead and, and look into it. Thank you so much. The other thing I will say before we leave is that it's really important to have an elder law attorney look at documents that you have, um, have an elder law attorney look at documents that you may already have in place. If they've been drafted by an elder law attorney, that's probably good. Although sometimes the laws change every couple of years. So just um, making sure that the documents that you think you have in place allow you to do the things that you may need to do in the future. Um, that's not something that the social workers can help you navigate. Um, so really getting an elder law attorney um, that can help, um, like Ms. Duckett, is, is really a strong recommendation that I have because you don't want to find out that the document is ineffective in a crisis. 
um, and so really taking steps to plan proactively um, can be so beneficial in the long run in avoiding these crisis situations that um, we have seen in the clinic side um, time and again. So thank you for this information um, that you have shared with people. Um, we've got um, people in the chat saying thank you so much about um, for this very helpful information. Um, we really appreciate your time this morning. Our next dementia lecture series will be the second week in October on Wednesday at noon again. Um, we will be having a presentation on Medicare open enrollment. Um, so this is, we'll have Anita um, Alvarez um, with the Georgia SHIP or Georgia CARES, the state health insurance plan. Um, we'll be coming and giving a presentation about how to select your Medicare plan um, and which one may be, may be right for you during this upcoming open enrollment. Just because you have a Medicare plan already selected for 2022 does not mean that it will be the best plan for you in 2023. Uh, so if you need more information about how to help navigate those very complicated um, insurance issues, it's what our topic will be next. Again, thank you so much for second. It has been a pleasure spending this hour with you. Thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. <laughs> it's always an honor. <laughs> Thank y'all. All right. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye, guys. Thanks so much.